Happy New Year. This is Signals from Pittsburgh. Uh, this is Brittany. And this is Mr. Wills. And so we just came out of a, a kind of a depressing year, 2020, with COVID, a whole pandemic and all that. Um, so we're going to start out 2021 with a director that um, is, you know, well known for having a bunch of depressing movies. So today we're talking about uh, Darren Aronofsky. He, he's not that, yeah, it's not going to be lighthearted. Yeah. Um, but 2021 also was still depressing. It's everybody thought like when the year would change, like like COVID would immediately evaporate and that we wouldn't have the political yeah. turmoil. And actually, it's both have gotten worse. So, I mean, not yeah, to depress so. everybody. <laughs> so sit back and relax and forget about it while you listen to this. <laughs> yeah, let's let's think about let's think about death and, you know, drugs, the apocalypse. Wait, are we already thinking about that? Okay, you're in the right state of mind then. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll kind of jump into it here. So uh, I own o- almost all of his movies, uh, which I didn't even realize until we first kind of started talking about maybe doing this idea. Um, I did not have The Wrestler. That's one that I missed. And then uh, I think Noah is the only other one that I don't own. Um, and I, that's the only one I haven't seen. Uh, otherwise, I've seen all of them, but most recently I saw The Wrestler. And that was kind of, um, I don't know, I, I kind of dragged my feet on watching it, knowing his other movies. I was like, oh, God, I have to be in the right state of mind to, like, really get into this and all that. But um, The Wrestler was, it was different. It was different than his other uh, films. It was a little more, I guess, accessible in the sense that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, like, <laughs> quite as depressing. I don't know how to describe it. It wasn't as intense oh no what do you think oh i i love i think the wrestler was the first one of aronofsky's movies where i came out not wanting to open up my wrist that being said at that (laughs) time i had not seen the fountain um Mm -hmm. but yeah i um i really dig the wrestler obviously i'm a huge wrestling fan uh but i just thought um it was cool it was a more of a you know redemption story or, you know, a pseudo-redemption story. Uh, what's great about Aronofsky is his characters. And, the, I mean, a lot of the times they go through just... It's kind of Coen Brother-esque without the comedy. It's like, in Coen Brothers movies, it's like anything that can go wrong will go wrong to the antagonist. <laughs> but it's like with Aronofsky, it's like people like die by their vices in the most horrible, horrific ways. And at least yeah, with... Yeah. The wrestler, I thought everybody liked Randy the Ram, and you could, you know, you could realize that he knew he was flawed, and he knew that um, his road back was going to be a hard one. You you only get one shot really at the top, and he was at the top of his game. And I just kind of liked him trying to fix things. And there is a scene if we can just jump right into talking about the scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With his daughter, I thought it was one of the most harrowing scenes where she's like, sometimes things, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but she's like, sometimes things are just fucked up and you can't fix them. And I think that was one of the strongest scenes in that movie. It was, That was more of a tear-jerking scene, but, she, and uh, played by Evan Rachel Wood, who's great in this, and she's great in Westworld. If you haven't seen Westworld, check that out. Yeah. But um, It took me a minute to recognize her, too, because I had never seen her with dark hair. It's like, oh. Why do I know her? And then I and then I figured it out, especially when she started crying. <laughs> You're like, oh, I, I recognize like, that. Like, oh, okay, yeah, I know who that is. <laughs> yeah, I thought uh, I thought she was great in this. I thought she was believable, and I, like I said, that scene there really touched me because he's just a fuck up. You can be successful. You can be at the top you of your game. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I can. I can totally relate. <laughs> I'm not even great. At, I'm not even great at one thing. At least at one point, he was the greatest at one thing, and he had just kind of, you know, his star had fallen, and this was his, you know, and he couldn't do what he used to do at the caliber he used to do it at. I think everybody can relate to that. Yeah, he was kind of dealing with like his own body betraying him. Like, he still wanted to do it, and he still had the skills, but his, like, physically, his body was just betraying him. And the one thing that he felt like he didn't screw up and was good at. And that was really sad to see him kind of spiral down like that. Yeah, and with wrestling, um, as many people know that are fans, 
even in the top guys. I mean, Hulk Hogan, essentially he was kind of a, you know, pseudo Hulk Hogan kind of a representation. But, mm-hmm. you know, Hulk Hogan's kind of always been on top, but he's been through some drama lately with his by his own doing. But it was kind of like if Hulk Hogan fell to the bottom, bottom, bottom. Uh, another great scene in this film is where he goes to that um, autograph. Uh, there's this like just this mm-hmm. autograph signing. And I've been to those autograph signings. They're in a high school and gymnasium. And it's just guys that used to curtain jerk back in the 80s. They weren't even that big of stars. Uh, or like yeah. maybe they did have star power at one point, but were never never made the big money, as people like to say. And the one guy's like has a catheter or whatever it was. And he's just like it's overflowing. And it's just like this like the saddest, most depressing. Yeah, he looks around and like everybody has something wrong with him. You know, everybody's like older, like washed out, you know, like hanging on, <laughs> do, doing some signings, you know, and hopefully somebody shows up. And yeah, he was just looking around and the look in his eyes was so sad. He was just like, fuck this, man. I can't believe I'm here right now. You know, I can't believe this is where I am. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of we're just going to hop around. Usually we do like the deep dives on these kind of episodes, but I'm just you know, going with the flow, hopping around to some of the favorite mm-hmm. scenes in our movies here. Uh, but I, yeah, I just like that scene because he, he can tell he's like, this isn't me. This isn't where I belong. I'm Randy, you know, I'm Randy the Ram Robinson. And like, it's it's just hilarious. And he, his day-to-day life is so like depressing. He's like living in a trailer. He's working at a shitty grocery store where people treat him like shit, including his boss. Nobody mm-hmm. gives him the respect he really believes he deserves and possibly does deserve. Um, Cause I think Mickey Rourke in this film was just phenomenal. And this is, this it's kind of autobiographical film for Mickey Rourke because he was a big star. He was a good looking guy in the eighties and early nineties. And then he left Hollywood. He turned down major roles. He was offered pretty much every major role in the 1980s when he started acting in the 1990s was offered to Mickey Rourke. He was the Tom Cruise, you know, imagine if Tom Cruise today turned down Mission Impossible and all the Tom Cruise movies, it would be the same. That would, that was, yeah, yeah, that was Mickey Rourke then, but he was just, he didn't give a shit. He just did the movies that he wanted to do. And then he quit, like he kind of semi-retired halfway through and then got into boxing and fucked up his, uh, fucked up his face, got bad plastic surgery. And then Sin City was really his first movie back that kind of put him... I mean, he had been still doing movies. He was in um, Man on Fire, which was really good. Um, the one with Denzel Washington, that was really good. Yeah. And he had a, like a role in that. He was in that do- movie Domino, which was good, um, which was Tony Scott. It was just... A, I mean, it was what it was. It was a fun, you know, Tony Scott movie, which I like Tony Scott. He's no Ridley Scott, but... He, he's directed some good <laughs> movies. Um, True Romance being one of my favorites. But Domino Domino was fun to check out. But I, I digress. Mickey Rourke in this film, this was like an Oscar-worthy performance. You can tell he could relate to oh, yeah. having the world in his grasp and kind of letting it slip through his fingers. And this was his shot at redemption. Sorry to go off on a tangent there. No, that's okay. I know it was, um, it was, like, it was highly regarded. Um, I don't know if it won anything... Did it win much here in the U.S.? But I know it won a lot of stuff, foreign awards and things like that. Same with The Fountain. That didn't, like, do well here, but um, a lot of foreign festivals and award ceremonies, um, it won for Best Foreign Film, (laughs) which took me a second when I was reading it. I'm like, what? Best Foreign Film? But, yeah, it makes sense because, I mean, it's, like, Italian best of, things like that. They're equivalent to the Oscars or whatever is in cinema. But um, I know, yeah, The Wrestler got a uh, a lot of hype. Um, when it came out. And I don't know, I guess I did miss it, but I think part of it was I was coming... I I saw most of his movies late, we'll say. Um, As in, I just didn't get to see them in theater for whatever reason every time they came out. So usually I'd be like a year or two behind, sometimes more, in seeing them. So uh, usually I'd get something spoiled or blah, blah, blah. And The Wrestler was one that was always on my list and just I never came back around to the rotation. Um, Along with me just not knowing... Well, knowing his other movies, and then I'm like, well, I'm also not super big into wrestling, um, so am I even going to like it? So I just never, I never made the priority, but I kind of regret that now. Um, but I don't know, because of the podcast, I, I put it to the top of my list, and I'm really glad that I did. Because uh, it's, it's one of my top twos now, I think, or maybe top three. 
It is definitely a great movie. Uh, yeah, it was nominated for two Oscars. It looks like he... Oh, um, he won, be- like, best lead. Yeah, uh, he won a Golden Globe as the best actor in this. And then Bruce uh, Springsteen won um, Golden Globe for best song. Oh, yeah, because he wrote... Yeah, he, he wrote... Didn't did he? I think he wrote the song for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. Marissa um, uh, Tomei, I think that's how you say her last name. Yeah, Marissa Tomei. She, I think she won a couple things for like supporting actress. She was uh, n- she was nominated for um, it looks like a Golden Globe, and um, she was nominated that w- and nominated for an Oscar as well. Okay, can you imagine being nominated for an Oscar? I'd be happy enough with that, honestly. Even if I didn't yeah. win, I'd be like, God, I got nominated for something like that. Well, she had already won for uh, My Cousin Vinny a long time ago. That was yeah, like her She's big like, I already got one. Don't need it. No, right. But kidding. no, she really, she, their connection in this film, what did you think about it? Because I thought that was like the heart of the movie was a, a uh, connection between Yeah, their, their dynamic. I really liked their dynamic and I really wanted things to work out. And uh, my favorite scene was definitely them catching up in the bar after she helped him go shopping for his daughter. And they just kind of sang karaoke um, and danced around a little bit and shared a moment before she was like, I got to get out of here. Yeah. I'm mixing business and pleasure. Yeah, because he, he visited her, you know, because she's a stripper. Spoiler alert. But, uh, yeah, she <laughs> she was great. Um, I think um, I really do think she, her role in this was kind of obviously she was nominated. So people did see you know, the greatness in that, but I think she should, I think both her and uh, Mickey Rourke deserved an Oscar for this film. Um, I think part of it too was there was some um, hubbub. He was going to, he was doing a wrestling angle storyline with Chris Jericho at the time. And they were going to have a match at that year's WrestleMania, which I believe was WrestleMania 25. I think it Mm might, I can't remember. Sorry. Uh, I know I should know that, but, um, uh, at that year's WrestleMania, he and Jericho were going to have a match. It might have been 23. I think it was the one where they went to Hollywood. Um, but his agent and all his um, people, his representation, were like, don't do this because you're up for a Oscar nod and it'll make it, it'll cheapen it. You know what I'm saying? That's essentially. So he did, like, get involved in WrestleMania. He ended up, like, punching Chris Jericho at WrestleMania, but he didn't have a full-blown match. But at one point there okay. was... There was back and forth. They were cutting promos, as they say, in the business on each other, mm-hmm. on like Larry King. And there was talks about him having a full-blown wrestling match at WrestleMania with Chris Jericho. But I think he staved off because he thought he was going to win the Oscar and that was going to hurt his chances if he did that. Oh, That's too bad that that had a kind of a factor in that. But, you know, you do what you got to do. Right. But, yeah, their chemistry, though. I, I love those two. They were perfectly cast together for those characters, I think. And- yeah, I I loved it. I thought um, I really loved the scene that you just mentioned, uh, where they sing about uh, you know round and round and how the eighties sucked. <laughs> it was like one <laughs> the of the nineties. You mean? <laughs> oh, nineties. Yeah, I, I sorry, nineties sucked. What are you saying? Yeah. Come on. The eighties were great. Yeah, how the nineties sucked. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So so that one was good, and I'm glad that this um, this episode kind of pushed me to watch that. Um, another uh, one that you, you well you missed. Two, right? So you said that you hadn't seen The Fountain until recently, and then the other one was Mother, which I we ended not, up watching together. Yes, I didn't see The, uh, the Fountain. We Neither one of us watched Noah. I, I'm not big on biblical movies. I may watch it at some point, but uh, I, yeah, I'd seen you Black know, Swan. I, honestly, I might at some point, cause I, because of this. I was just going to skip it, because it's really not my jive, usually. Right. Um, and I, I watched like a teaser trailer on it or something. And it does look like a darker take on some biblical stuff. And all of his movies have like biblical things in it. But um, to watch it as like a non-religious person, um, I still get a lot from his movies. But I might go back and watch that on a rainy day because it looks like it could actually be pretty intense. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll check it out at some point. But we wanted to hit the the main ones. And I had not seen The Fountain uh, prior to this episode. But I was... Always curious about it, and since we agreed we're going to do a, an Aronofsky episode, obviously I'd seen Pi, which is a mindfuck of a movie and has an insane ending, 
and we can get into that a little later, and Requiem for a Dream, I don't ever need to watch again because I don't have any problem being depressed, so there's no <laughs> need for... not that, And that, that's not me shitting on the film. I think it's a very well-done movie. It's too well done to where it just yeah. gives you anxiety. But um, I feel I th- like, uh, like multiple movies of his are kind of like that. Like, they were good. And you, I wouldn't say enjoyed them, but I would also say you liked them, you know. They were good, but you don't ever have, like, the urge to go out of your way to watch those again, usually. (laughs) At least I don't think so. I think uh, with this case, uh, with Requiem for Dream, if I can go back to that for one second, is Mm -hmm. you see characters and you want them, you know, most of the time you want the lead characters. Um, You know, you have Jared Leto's character and his mom and, um, is it Marlon Wayans? Yep. Yeah. Marlon Wayans Jennifer and then Connelly. Jennifer Connelly. And you're like, oh, you know, these, you know, Jennifer Connelly and Jared Leto's character are in love. Marlon Wayans, they're all friends and they're just trying to get drugs and score and have a party. And then they have a plan to get drugs and sell them. But, you know, everybody gives into their vices. And then his mom, played by uh, Ellen Burstyn from uh, Exorcist fame, she she's great in that. She's also in The Fountain. But uh, that film, I, I don't want to touch too much on it. Personally, I'll just give you my opinion up front on that. It's it's just so it's so hard to watch those characters because they keep touching the stove. They keep falling into their vice and their vice ultimately <laughs> swallows them up. So that's why I say I'm not shooting on Requiem for a Dream. I think it is a very great and well done uh, movie. It's just hard for me to watch. I can watch horror movies. Yeah, it's a tough watch, but in a in a good way. It's not a bad movie. It's hard. No, to no, describe. no, not at all. <laughs> It's very. It's a movie full of existential dread. Yeah, if it, like if somebody, I don't know, I would recommend it, but I would also say like I don't know, make sure you like have a massage plan for the next day or a spa visit or something. You know, it's it's definitely not going to put you in a spry mood. You know, if someone was inanely bubbly, you know those people like with that fake enthusiasm that are just very vapid, I would be like, you know what movie you would love. <laughs> Requiem for a Dream, and I think it would balance them out. Like, you know, people that are just manic. I said, watch yeah. Requiem for a Dream. That'll that set movie. you straight. That'll straighten you right out. We're, <laughs> we're, we're, de- we're deep diving on the ones that we really just kind of enjoyed here. Um, as far as The Fountain goes, Brittany did turn me on to this film, and it was always on my back burner, as The Wrestler was for her. I loved this movie. I thought, you know, I've watched a lot of films. I haven't watched... I'm not... As much of a connoisseur as I like to be, but I mean that's what we talk about here are films we love. So and I always try new stuff, but um I'm sad I missed this one, but I'm glad I've discovered it now. Very underrated. Um it packs a lot into its runtime too. It it felt very you know, obviously I think you would have liked to make a grander film, but I just think it handles death and loss and the struggle of life and what it all means and acceptance of death. Mm-hmm. And that life breeds new death in such a profound and artistic and beautiful way. It's it's a deeply sad movie, but in a different way. Like, I could just look at it, and it's just beautiful. It's the story of a doctor played by Hugh Jackman who's trying to save the life of his wife who has cancer. And it's played by Rachel Weisz. He is a man obsessed with saving her life. And at this point, she is, she's writing a novel about kind of what she's experienced and it's called the fountain and it's about one man's quest spain is being invaded by outsiders and by the church and being taken over and the queen who in the sense of the novel in the film is played by rachel ice and a conquistador who i initially i thought was ponce de leon but he's a ponce de leon like character who was um looking <coughs> for essentially a fountain of youth or you know the tree to save spain and to pledges fealty to his queen and then um, goes on a pilgrimage to uh, find this tree and bring back the elixir of life to save Spain. That's that's her novel. And then outside of that, he's a doctor. You know, Hugh Jackman's main character is a doctor who is on the verge of finding, they found this root from this tree that stops the growth of uh, cancer cells. So he's testing on this monkey to see if it, it can stop. And it's kind of a struggle with that. So that's the broad strokes of the film, but I loved it. Okay, so I'll start. I have so many thoughts on this. This is actually what uh, prompted the idea to talk about Darren Aronofsky, because 
I wanted to talk about the fountain um, specifically uh, after we did Blood Machines because there's a lot of like outer space stuff. Like I was really impressed with their budget and their effects and things like that. So it made me think of the fountain and it kind of evolved into what we're doing now. But originally when it came out, it came out in 2006 and I was in high school and I saw it about a year later. At that time, I was like, oh, I'm thinking about college. I'm gonna, I'm, I already picked. I was going to uh, go for visual effects, motion graphics, film, stuff like that. So, of course, I saw the trailer. And I was like, whoa, these like effects look crazy. I got to watch it. Um, and then at that point, I had seen Pi and Requiem for a Dream. And I was like, OK, I'm in. I don't know what I was thinking, though, because I was like, it's just going to be like a visually cool movie. You know, I didn't know what to think about the story. Um, so I watched it, and of course I was blown away by the visuals. But man, it like I did not expect to be so struck to the core by the story. Um, it was just so sad and kind of I, I don't know happy and accepting at the same time because it kind of goes through sadness, denial, grief, acceptance. You know that whole that whole thing. And so it it ended up affecting me way more than I expected on so many levels and just really inspiring me to really be like, this is the direction I want to go in my life. So it was, it kind of came out during a good turning point in my life to really keep me going in the direction I wanted to go. Um, But it wasn't until later when I got into college and then I eventually bought like a DVD of it and then eventually the Blu-ray where I could watch the special features. I was just like blown away that pretty much all the effects were practical and I don't know how much, I don't know if you, did you watch the special features on that Blu-ray or no? Yeah, I watched some of it, but yeah, I was, pretty it? Blown, I was pretty blown away. I loved, one of my favorite things was the tree and the orb, like the orb that they were in when they were um, mm-hmm. on their way to Zabalba. I thought that was one of the coolest sequences and it was just like visually stunning. So and cool. It, yeah, I had not And it, I think it aged pretty well, right? So yeah, it's been, the, I th- you know, yeah. 15 years or something. So yeah, I mean, it was all done with practical stuff but it's it's weird it's hard to say that people are like you know it's all practical but there was digital elements right so but they're all filmed separately and had to be digitally layered on top of each other if that makes sense so it's kind of a combination but all the the galaxy and everything like that was done by a guy named peter parks and he's a not to be confused with peter parker Yeah, I know. That's the only reason I remember his name, actually. (laughs) I'm like, Peter Parker. (laughs) Peter Parks. Just don't say er. Right. Um, (laughs) Anyway, he's he's actually a marine biologist and photographer, but he has um, all this gear in his house um, to do micro photography. And so what he did was he filmed, like, up close, sometimes up to, like, 500 times magnification, Uh, chemical reactions in tiny petri dishes using like yeast or like curry powder baby power iodine all sorts of stuff there's interviews with him and he never discloses quite everything he used he just kind of gives you a little bit of an idea but um i thought it was like incredible um and a really inventive way to figure out how to (laughs) do like space visuals uh without breaking the bank and um, keeping the, the budget down. And I think it really holds up after all these years still. And I guess that was the idea. In a couple interviews, Darren was like, oh, I saw like the Matrix. And he knew he wanted to have a lot of visuals in the fountain, obviously. Uh, but he was like, I just, I don't want it to age badly. And thinking of like 2001 A Space Odyssey, it still looks pretty good now even. <laughs> so he's like, I need to like find a way to do that so it doesn't look bad um, in like 10 or 15 years. And I think he was successful in that. I think that was, like, brilliant and kind of an out-of-the-box way to think about getting visuals. And I think more people should do that. Um, And then, like, that tree bubble thing, I think it was a miniature just shot on a blue screen or a green screen, and they just layered it all together and timed it. And it was just mind-blowing to me. Yeah, I I loved it. I thought that was... I thought it was really cool. I thought it was a great... It had its own style which was a cool way uh with you saying that that really illuminates how they did that because i didn't i don't think i saw that but that's really cool because it gave the film its own its own language visually and i thought that was yeah and that's so important to have in a movie like that absolutely i just thought it was so visually arresting because it could have been a very it could have been like requiem for a dream or pie very 
dark and dank and you know i mean it, it you know beautiful in color and pie is beautiful in black and white but it's still like gritty you know gritty i don't know if gritty is the right word more like hollow like it's there's a lot mm-hmm. of space a lot of um tense space and with the fountain it was more a of, there was heart because you know uh thomas who that is um Hugh Jackman's character, the, the Doctor Thomas, it was his race because Izzy, his wife, played by Rachel Weisz, her life was coming to an end, and it was his race to find the cure for her cancer. But she is probably the most centered character in the entire movie because she knows she knows what's coming and she accepts it, and her yeah, she spends her time the the what's left of her time trying to just have good moments and appreciate the rest of the time that she has. Meanwhile, what I found sad is like Tom, uh, Hugh Jackman's character just preoccupies himself with trying to stop the inevitable. So he kind of misses out on a lot of uh, sweet moments they could have had because he's so, He's kind of like in denial and just trying to race against the clock, like you were saying. And it's kind of sad to see uh, the difference in those two characters and how they're dealing with it. And there is a specific scene that really always like it always kills me. I always cry. And it's when he's like there for her and trying to understand her accepting her fate and all that stuff. And he ends up like leaving and he just like goes down the hallway to another room and just finally like just cries just completely like lets it all out and it's so sad to see well it's so sad to see Hugh Jackman ball his eyes out but in the context of the movie it's just he's got so much built up in there and it's like you can see so much pain in that moment and that's not even one of the fantastical moments that's the more grounded reality moments of the movie and that that always makes me cry it's so sad it it, it was a, it's a very deeply emotional scene and yeah, it's it's sad. Hugh Jackman was a tour de force in this film. Like he yeah. he carried this film. I believe. I think he deserved an Oscar for this because I think it's just so criminally. I mean, people who've seen it, seen it, and people who like it, they it has its audience. But I mm-hmm. just thought his um, acting in this was so was so good because he was obsessed. But then you could see he did he had love. He he, and then at the end, it there was acceptance, but much. It's kind of, a, you know, the antithesis of Requiem for a Dream, where the characters in there, uh, you know, Jared Leto and crew, um, they're driven by, you know, the next, you know, the next fix. And even, you know, his mother's driven by, you know, being on television and essentially mm-hmm. starving herself, trying not to starve herself, but, you know, doing, relying on drugs to lose weight. And then it just, they just become victims of that to where Hugh Jackman's obsession is based in love but it's also fighting against the tide to where (laughs) you know death comes for us all and that's what's so great and um izzy rachel weiss's character writing her novel is leaving something to the world and then there is a a great scene that i love where she said she had met uh she had met a man when she was on uh on vacation moses morales she had met this man uh she was abroad and she met this man called moses morales uh, and she she tell he tells a story about his father dying, and he says his father told him, "Death is the road to awe, mm. not all awe, like a w." Yeah. Um, she's like, you know, how do you accept this? You know, Moses said his father lived on. He lives on in the tree, and the branches that reach to the sky, and the bird that eats from the tree. He 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 gets to fly his spirit his material goes on in the world of the living even though he is gone you know corporeal husk yeah. of what he was has his soul and his energy lives on and everything and everything and rebirth and that's this movie is about the acceptance of death and to me and and pretty blatant pretty over and and rebirth i think you can get caught up on oh you know is he dies spoiler alert um but that's when he was bawling out is he dies and she dies not really at right at the end either but she dies and then Hugh Jackman Thomas he becomes obsessed with finishing her book cuz that's what she she asked him to do that right before she died she said finish my book it was her it was her living on in the tree it was her story 
was her living on in the world along with she gave him a seed to plant for her and it there's all kinds of weirdness i don't want to you know i don't want to spoil everything but <laughs> there's it's, so much it's not weirdness it's actually really cool and it's very art it's a stunning artistic representation of like i said death and rebirth it's it's visually it's visual storytelling at its best that's that's what i meant to say but um yeah and uh flash forward we get future jumps in the film where they're on this orb with the tree of essentially the tree of life and they're heading to Zialba, which is the, um, or sorry, Z- Zibalba, which is the um, Mayan land of the dead. Thomas in the future thinks, you know, they're going to survive it and the tree's going to make it and Zibalba's going to be destroyed. And then, you know, he realizes it's all for naught. Now, I took that as he actually did find a way to live on. I know it's open to interpretation. So I took yeah. it that he, now, he, even though she had passed away, he now had like a mortal life. So it, now he was like in the future without his love and he couldn't die. That's how I took it. I don't know how mm-hmm. you saw that, but. Um, well, it's been a while since I've actually seen the movie now, especially since I let you borrow my Blu-ray. Not that right. I can't find it anywhere else on the internet, you know, guys. Right. Right. But um, I think maybe I interpreted it a little different. Um, it seemed like he was at first when you see him as like the monk, he's trying to find a way to. Uh, well, keep them alive. You did say that. Um, but it seemed, it was like futile. Like, no matter what he did, the tree was still slowly dying. And he was trying to, I don't know, kind of take some of that tree into himself um, with the tattoos and stuff to yes. try and, I don't know, try try to kind of bond with it in a way. He was taking bark from the tree. That's how yeah. they were developing the the drug that was killing the cancer it they were actually using bits of the tree and it was healing and i i took it as he took bits of the tree and it kept him alive it prolonged his life and he was trying to prolong the tree's life because the izzy was living on in the tree in his mind you know right yeah and he still he still like i took it as he still couldn't let let it go no um, that, until the end, <laughs> when they're cr- the careening toward, um, it's an exploding star. Yeah, it's um, a in the end, you know. Uh, oh, spoiler alert! No, um, <laughs> no, this movie is like there, there's like three different storylines going on at the same time that also interconnect perfectly. You'll see when you watch it. Um, but yeah, they're like careening towards this exploding star, and he has to eventually accept that's what's going to happen, <laughs> no, no matter how long he's just putting it off. And once he accepts it, they, you know, kind of take off and explode. And he's, I feel like he's reborn a new, like, but I feel like it's probably both, both of them together reborn into a new energy. Yeah. Into the, so I don't know. I don't know. That's not really that different than yours, but no, no, that's how you saw it. It's just, to me, it symbolized just acceptance of what it is and rebirth of his new life without her. Yeah, absolutely. The new normal, (laughs) as we say. From 21, 20, oh, no. 21, 20, 2020, 21, 20, uh, <laughs> 21, 12 by Rush. This movie, this movie syncs up perfectly with 21, 12 from Rush. I don't know that for a fact, but try it. <laughs> Let's do an experiment. Let us know what happens. Um, uh, it just, uh, oh yeah. And he seems relieved when he's like, I'm going to die. Cause I feel like that's why I thought he was kind of on the edge of immortality because he seemed when the tree died, you know, spoiler, when the tree dies, he's alone again. He lost Izzy twice. And mm-hmm. he's like, I'm going to die because he couldn't die because he kept himself. He prolonged his life. So he yeah. felt like he couldn't die. But cra- careening into, you know, an exploding star, which uh, Zababa was is um, that's what the ancient Mayans, the ancient Mayans were the ones that found the tree of life. in the in the story, the uh, character, the first Mayan man sacrificed himself to give birth to the tree of life. So to give life, he killed himself. There's a great scene where, you know, the character finds it and um, it's not all, it's uh, it's not what he thought he was getting into. Let's put it that way. The, the, the <laughs> yeah. fictional character of the story. Can't give it all away. <laughs> exactly. But loved it. Yeah. So that, that one, obviously uh, we had more to say about. Oh, yeah. um, it is one of my favorites. Uh, I, I, now that I've seen the wrestler, um, I wrestle with my top two. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Wah, wah. 
Um, yeah, no, I d- my top my tops are the wrestler, um, a mother, and the fountain. But the wrestler is probably like the third the third little wheel on there. Like I feel like depending on my mood, it moves around. But um, yeah, those three are probably my favorite. I mean, Black Swan is really freaking good. I saw Black Swan, Swan in the theater when it came out. Um, did. Yeah, I just thought the performances in that film were um, once again. It's like. Just an endurance test. That one wasn't as hard uh, to watch. And Wrestler and Black Swan have, you know, a similar narrative to where it's like Randy the Ram Robinson, Mickey Rourke's character, was, um, you know, was trying to regain what he had reached. And then Natalie Portman's character in Black Swan was trying to... She's just trying to reach it. (laughs) Their trajectories were headed in the same way, but uh, Randy the Ram had been there and she... She was on her way to becoming the Black Swan. They're both about the sacrifices you have to make to be a performer and to be the best performer. And I thought those were, I thought they're, they're great. They're great companion pieces as movies. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I just thought everybody, I thought Vincent Cassell uh, was great in uh, Black yeah. Swan. And he's just a fucking kind of a scumbag, but uh, <laughs> su- such a great character. Um, Mia Kunis is great. But uh, what was your thoughts on that one? I enjoyed it quite a bit. It always stands out to me first, um, like visuals or visual style or tone. Yes. Um, especially if it's like effects. So all the effects that went into it, it's not effects heavy. Um, they're all very subtle, um, but especially in the climax, I think they did a really good job. Um, I won't give that one away too much, but just they did a lot of things practical again. There was more CG in that one than some of the others, um, but the blend was so perfect. They didn't overuse anything. But I was impressed by uh, the fact that they used so many sets with mirrors because, you know, it's about a ballerina. There's like, you know, half their life is looking at a mirror at their form. Um, But to be able to film a movie with so many mirrors in it, even when she's not in the dance studio. And not once did I remember seeing a boom in one of the mirrors or one of the camera guys in one of the mirrors because even her bedroom um it just has mirrors everywhere <laughs> so yeah no i mean i know i kind of went in that direction with it but the story is also very good um i love the dynamic of the characters and the the pressure that you feel watching uh a nina yes um you can just feel the pressure of her life like emanating off the screen um and it just feels like she's gonna snap at any moment and she's so soft-spoken for a majority of the movie. She, you, you just want to shake her through the screen, like, break out of your shell, come on. That one's really good, too. It's more, I would say it's almost more of like a horror or like thriller than some of the other ones. It's definitely the most horrifying movie about ballet since the original Suspiria, because this came out before the remake. <laughs> but it was like, it's like Aronofsky's like, give me, you know, give me a shot. And uh, I will, uh, I will uh, make a terrifying movie about ballet. You just watch. Yeah, you could give him. You could just like pick a subject out of a hat, and he could probably find a really interesting way to show it. Um, we didn't really talk about Mother that much, but I mean, you guys should just like watch that. It's like, it's it's like anxiety in a movie. Um, I think. <laughs> yes. But yeah, Mother is my other favorite. Um, I've never seen a movie that makes me feel so anxious. <laughs> In my life, everything about it, the sound design, uh, the camera, just constantly. And it it, it pretty much never lets up. It's just like anxiety in a movie, you know. If you're someone who doesn't get anxious, uh, you should watch this and let me know if you get anxious or not, even a little bit. But if you're already a semi-anxious person, (laughs) this just like, it it strikes every nerve that you could possibly have. And it's weird because I search for movies that make me feel uncomfortable. And this one did it like nothing else in a long time. I thought to where this movie... Now, people say, once again, to go back to Requiem, Requiem is like his masterpiece. But I thought this... I know in this movie kind of got panned by a lot of people. But I thought this movie showed him growing as a filmmaker and in the mood of tone. Like, I, yes, he did some awesome, you know, visual effects and obviously like tension building and, and dread in existential dread in Requiem. But I thought here he applied it differently and it was more out of it's it's when you when you have a narrative about drug heroin users specifically, there's only one ending. Mm-hmm. 
unfortunately, unless they kick, you know, and I'm not trying to be, you know, we're talking about Aronofsky. So, I mean, (laughs) it is what it is. But um, in Mother, it was built in in this dream of this family of Javier Bardem and uh, Jennifer Lawrence in this starting this family. And you love both of these characters. I mean, they just, they're great in this. Um, people are dismissive of the story and, oh, it's too much. And, you know, kind of maybe people think it's cinematic diarrhea. I, I No, <laughs> I, I, th- I enjoyed it. Well, I think it's uh, chaos uh, in a, in a almost uncontrolled form. Like it's, it's so chaotic, but it still holds itself together enough <laughs> to keep going. And when you think it's at its worst, it just keeps going. Yeah, and it's chaos in a very, it's it's chaos, but it's done in a very cinematic. It's cinematic chaos, and it's done in a very structured way. As as weird as that yeah. sounds. Well, I I wouldn't say for the most part it's not explosive. It's like a slow build. It like sneaks up on you. It's tension, but there is also you know there's tension, there's moments of chaos, and then there's just. You know, jump scares, there's what the fuck moments, and it's all pretty believable. And then by the end, it's like the acid kicked in. It's, a, <laughs> it's like yeah. If, yeah. If, if if you've ever done acid or mushrooms, it's like hallucinogenics. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and this th- these are kind of the, the three three main films we decided to focus on. But so I, this one's fresh in my mind. I dug it. That was the first time I watched it. We watched it together. And I'm a big fan of Javier, B- Javier Bardem, easy for me to say. So anything he's in, I'll watch. I loved him in Skyfall. Yeah. I just loved him. There's a, a movie he's in, uh, Perdita Durango, a.k.a. Dance with the Devil, which is a um, spinoff of Wild at Heart, which is one of my favorite movies. I thought he was great in this. As a, It was a great representation. He acted as like a conduit to the absurdity and the ridiculousness and the chaos of this movie, just a, a writer, a creative force obsessed with giving and giving and giving, but n- not to the person that loved him the most mm-hmm. in the, in the way she needed it. And that's just one dynamic, but it, it's like, yeah. you can't really, I'm just talking about him now. You can't really fault his character. He just had blind, he, he had blind creative passion for his fans. So he, he was obsessed in the way that he wanted to please his audience. He wanted to please his fans yeah. and his fans turn out being some of the most toxic people ever. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I think that was a good <laughs> rundown on that. I, I felt, um, she, uh, Jennifer Lawrence's character, um, as mother, I, there are multiple times again, um, that I just wanted to reach through the screen and shake her. She is, she is so soft spoken about it all. Um, she's just like, I just feel like she gets, she's a doormat half the time. Um, and then she does eventually start breaking out of that a little bit later in the movie as things kind of start to intensify, but, uh, definitely many moments where I just wanted to shake her like, girl, say something, stand up for yourself. But she just uh, absolutely loves, um, Javier's character, um, him. And she just, she just loves him completely. Like, you know, there's no... She just everything's for him, pretty much. She he she has the obsession for him, like yeah. like he has the obsession for his fans and his work, and it's yeah. not. And he doesn't have what is great about this movie. What I liked at least about this story, and once again, you know, what negative reviews or whatever be damned. This is my opinion. It's our show. I liked it. <laughs> it's our show. We liked it. <laughs> we liked it. So, uh, what's great about his character is. And it would have been real easy to make him dismissive and cold and, you know, an asshole to her. And when I said he didn't give her earlier, when I stated he didn't give her what she needed back, I don't mean that he was mean. He was, he was never mean. He's never mean to her. He actually, you can see that he really has love, but he was, he's a split character. He is, he is at his core, a creator and needs the acceptance. It's not even that he doesn't love his wife. It's not that he doesn't want to have this perfect house that she's pretty much rebuilding this house that burned down from nothing from, you know, back, back from the ashes to please him is kind of the starting narrative of the story. And the fact 
that she's willing to like, it doesn't matter anything that goes wrong. It doesn't matter because I will do anything for you to make us happy together to make you happy. And Mm -hmm. so she has the obsession towards him that he has towards creative, but he loves her. He deeply loves her. It's just, I believe he's unable to, you know, compartmentalize, not even compartmentalize, but um, make it cohesive. He's unable to marry his creative side with her love. He, he, there's no coherent there. Yeah. Cohesion. No. No, what? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no, I think that's a, I think that's a really good way to explain that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you see, there's a couple other characters in the movie, um, that are interesting. I don't know how much I'll go into it, but we, we have an Ed Harris. Ed Harris alert. <laughs> um, another Westworld man in and, black, you know. And Creepshow. So Pittsburgh. Uh, and Creepshow, yeah. So we got our Pittsburgh connection. We almost always make it there, right? Yeah. I, you, there's always a Pittsburgh connection. Ed Harris showing up. Also, you know, let let me let me restate that. Ed Harris, King Billy <laughs> from Night Riders. <laughs> exactly. So we have we have him, which I was pleased to see the first time. I didn't know who was in it before I watched it. Other than obviously Jennifer Lawrence on the cover. Right. Um, we have Michelle Pfeiffer that She's great. played a real good role. <laughs> I love Michelle Pfeiffer. Uh any th- she is I really do think she is one of those most um one of those actresses that just doesn't get the credit she deserves. She's great in everything she's in, even if what she's in sucks. Except Grease 2. Grease 2 sucks. Don't watch Grease 2 ever. Um, <laughs> but other than that, uh, now we're going to have to watch Grease 2. No. Um, oh, no. Uh, but no, she's always great. I've loved her since uh, her portrayal of Catwoman and Batman Returns at a very young age. I saw that at a formidable age, so as you can imagine. My love for whips, <laughs> vi- vinyl. Um, it all started there. And Michelle Pfeiffer come from Batman Returns, but... Yeah, in this, she's just kind of an insufferable bitch, but in the best way possible. Exactly. And um, I saw an interview where she's like, oh, yeah, I didn't quite understand the movie when I saw the script, but I loved the character. She was, said she was very excited to play a character like that, you know. Um, yeah. So then you also have uh, the Gleasons, Brian and Dom Hall. I think that's how you say his name. It's kind of an unusual name. But they play brothers in the movie, and they're brothers in real life. So I thought that was cool, too. Yeah, it was, it was in the, their story. We won't give this, I don't want to give too much away of Mother on my end, um, because I think this is all about the build. It's like waiting for the, you know, drugs to kick in, waiting for the movie to kick in. But yeah, they, they had a great, everybody in this film had a great chemistry um, in regards yeah. to what was written for them and what direction they were yeah. given. Jennifer Lawrence really drove this movie and it was kind of, the movie kind of lives and dies by her reaction to things. And that's, you know, intentional. Well, it's from her perspective. And I don't think the camera ever leaves her. I don't think there's a single shot without her in it. So it's all from her perspective. Yeah. I think they said that it's either, you know, I think they mounted a camera to her at one point and then it's over the shoulder shots of her and her facial reactions. And she, she's the one who drives you through the movie. You know, she's the one, she, her emoting from her face or her just acting is uh spot on. It's like, she is one of the, it took me a while to get into Jennifer Lawrence. I didn't have any problem with her. I just, I had not seen her in anything of substance that I thought was really great. You know, she, mm-hmm. I see her show up here or there. She was like in the X-Men films and obviously that's not what she was known for. That was just probably a payday for her, but she played Mystique and I was like, okay, she did a decent job or what have you. But, um, yeah, I think, yeah. And the X-Men, um, yeah, like the first class movies and later on days of future past. And I thought, I thought she did a good job in those, but this movie really, you know, stands on its own as her like crowning moment. As far as what I've seen from her so far, I thought she really, this movie was really hers and she really commanded it. Yeah. So that's, it's definitely, um, it's definitely on my top. So I have a top three now. We'll add the wrestling in there. But um, that is a good segue, though. You mentioning X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, talking about um, Aronofsky. Aaron, oh, easy for me to say, right? It's my turn. <laughs> Aronofsky. Um, there's a couple interesting uh, like connections that I found. And the first one for me was um, I'm a big fan of the Metal Gear Solid series, and I'm sure you'll hear me say that a bunch of times forever for the duration of this podcast. (laughs) Um, 
So I'm a big Metal Gear Solid fan. Uh, David Hayter does the voice for Snake, if you don't know. And I, I found out that he writes screenplays. Um, and most, a lot of them that he's written were actually pretty successful, got bought, um, and then had to find directors for them. Um, but he, he wrote uh, the original screenplay for The Watchmen, actually, um, which got <laughs> passed around and changed quite a bit by the time it actually came out. Um, we have, uh, he did The Scorpion King, weird enough, weirdly enough, which I didn't know that. It's a connection to wrestling because that's The Rock's, uh, one of The Rock's first movies. Oh, yeah, The Rock. And then wasn't um, Rachel Wise? Yeah, also in the Mummy film. So there you so go. So look at that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so so there's some sort of connection. Maybe we're stretching sometimes, but there's connections. Um, but he did the, the X Men that came out in 2000. He wrote that one, um, and it got bought right away. And uh, Darren Aronofsky was supposed to originally direct that, along with I think he got offered the Watchmen, and then just something would always happen, and Darren couldn't do it. The, uh, the Watchmen he got interrupted um, because he got funding for the Fountain, and the Fountain was his like passion. He's like, if that's that's my goal as a filmmaker, to eventually make The Fountain. And if I never make anything after that, then I got to make the thing that I wanted to make. So they were in, I think, they were really close to production. They might have been in production uh, for the original Watchmen. <laughs> um, he offered to do both. He's like, I'll do Watchmen and I'll do The Fountain at the same time. And it just, it didn't work out. So uh, there's been multiple opportunities for uh, Aronofsky to do a comic book movie and then just something always happens every time and it doesn't get made yeah and i would love to see his interpretation it's uh, but with uh aronofsky you can tell that he he's kind of in he's like an an auteur you know to use a word that gets thrown around way too much but he really is he wants to have his vision of his story and i think it's more important for him to be original and creative especially Considering the fountain, because that was his, you know, what he considered his masterpiece, than it was to do an adaptation. While he may, you know, love doing that, to where it seems like Zack Snyder, who ended up making The Watchmen, like if he makes his original movie, is Sucker Punch. You know, what I'm saying, no, no, you know, say what you will, you like or you don't like Sucker Punch, but it's no fountain. So it's like if if Aronofsky's not making comic book movies, he's making. Requiem for a Dream. He's making Pie. He's making the you know the wrestler Black Swan. Yeah. You know these films that are you know pushing you know that are character driven and and pushing brown pushing boundaries and you know cinematic art to where you know it's not they're not he's not making popcorn movies when he when he's not doing adaptations which he has not done yet but I'm saying he would he wants to make film to where. Usually studios, when it comes to superheroes, they want you to make movies. Now, that is changing, and we had recently, um, we're diving into this. We watched a couple of videos and read a couple articles about him uh, even doing possibly Batman Year One before Christopher Nolan did Batman Begins. And he was working with Frank Miller on the screenplay, which is amazing, because for those of you that don't know, Frank Miller wrote Dark Knight Returns, Batman Year Run. It's easy for me to say Batman year one and then <laughs> essentially changed the dynamic of Batman. Batman got real cheesy in the 1960s and the 70s due to the comic book code. And he had kind of just gone off and was fighting aliens and doing all these crazy shit. And then the TV show with Adam West, as much as you love it, it's very camp. It lost the punch, the detective and the darkness, uh, the detective stories and the darkness of what batman was it was about him becoming a vigilante and using his wealth to avenge the death of his parents by bringing bringing justice to you know wrongdoers so uh and striking fear in them more importantly to where you know at the adam west batman god i love adam west rest in peace it was about surfing and and, and sharks and the bat and that's fine you know both those batmans can exist but in the 80s we were ready to have like the detective some Batman grit. back some grit. And then, you know, Frank Miller's notable for bringing that back to Batman, especially with those two pieces. Uh, if you haven't read dark Knight returns, you've seen its influence in every Batman since even, even the 1989 Batman with Michael Keaton has influence from dark Knight returns. So um, that's one of the seminal pieces in Batman history. And the other one, the follow up was Batman year one, which was kind of meant to be, a retelling slash a retcon of Batman's 
origin story. And that was what he and Aronofsky were working on together. And it was way ahead of its time. I think it was, they were working on it around the, in the early 2000s, 2002, 2003, it sounded mm-hmm. like. And Warner Brothers, you know, kind of got, kind of got cold feet with the idea because they had finished the screenplay and it was picked up by them. And they said, oh, this is too gritty. But what he, they came up with in that script was his adaptation. So things had changed. It wasn't a direct adaptation from the graphic novel or the four issues, but it was any had new elements where even in the new Batman, uh, in the trailer for the new Batman that hasn't come out with yet, the Matt Reeves film, what they've, what we found out about Arnosky screenplay is there are elements of that. Like Batman was living in a garage and in the screenplay, you see Batman, he's, it's more gritty. He's in a garage. He's not like the rich suave Bruce Wayne. And then moonlighting as Batman. It, it seemed more street level Batman. It was, it was him connecting with the streets of Gotham and really it, he said he wanted to make a 1970s movie, which this predated the Joker by like a decade plus and he said essentially what the joker was is what his vision of batman was going to be a a grittier 1970s feeling taxi driver-esque batman even frank miller said oh your batman's you know a little too dark you need to pull it back and when frank miller tells you you have to pull something back that's when you know you got dark gritty gold right there (laughs) exactly yeah no he's a little ahead of his time there um on that one and then of course later we got uh, Christopher Nolan was able to go a little darker on it. I like the Christopher Nolan Batman uh, movies. Um, the, the Dark Knight Rises was shot here in Pittsburgh, so that's a great connection. Yes. Um, yeah. And I thought uh, Batman Begins was fun. I, it had good elements of all of those, th- of year one, Dark Knight Returns, and um, kind of went a little fantastical way with Ra's al Ghul, but... Um, in the League of Shadows, but it was still based pretty much in reality. Dark Knight, I thought, was a great film, one of my favorite Batman movies, but I still would have liked to see Aronofsky's Year One. I thought it would have been cool, and considering that he said he wanted back then, now this is, I think this was even pre-Gladiator, or it might have been right after Gladiator, um, he wanted uh, Joaquin Phoenix for Batman, and knowing what we know now about yeah. him being cast in Todd Phillips' Joker and doing an, a phenomenal <laughs> job there, it's like can you imagine a universe where he would have played Batman instead of Joker? I, th- I think it would have been a hit. Well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't have been a hit, but I think it, I think it would have been, I think it was a good casting choice, personally. Yeah. But we'll see what he's, uh, we'll see what he's going to work on next. I do hope he gets a chance to eventually do a comic book movie because he seems very passionate and um, he just keeps missing the opportunities there. But um, I don't know, the way things are going now, I hope that, he kind of gets a chance within the next few years um, to make a gritty version of something. There's a lot of material out there. I hope I, I just hope to see something by him. Well, here's another. He's working on a movie currently with another connection to the Mummy. He's making a new movie with Brendan Fraser oh. called the called the Whale, and it's yeah. I, all I know is it's about Brendan Fraser's a fat guy, and it's I think. That's all I've read about. He's like, "Oh, good, it. somebody's casting me to like be myself." <laughs> yeah, I and I, you know, that's you know, uh, Brendan no. Fraser. I I feel bad for Brendan Fraser. Actually, if we can go off on a tangent here, I love him. Yeah, we can. I would. I was so sad to have not seen him in much, and I've been wanting him to come back for a long time. But I know he's like had a lot of shit in his life go down. So yeah, he had some badness. Uh, badness. Yeah, he had a lot of bad things go on before all this. The world falling apart. Uh, but so if he's going to be in an Aronofsky movie, he's going to have a lot of more bad shit cinematically go wrong for him. So, yeah, uh, there you go. So he's like, oh, this is perfect. I'll just channel all the bad shit. <laughs> I hope I hope it's great. I'm looking forward to that. I will see that as soon as I can when that comes out, because I oh, yeah. I've lo- I love Brendan Fraser. Um, it's too. weird how how connected it's almost like Aronofsky's destined to do a mummy movie maybe he should maybe <laughs> instead of that shitty uh dark universe one with tom cruise maybe they should uh do a uh mickey rourke uh, <laughs> mickey rourke as the mummy or uh, oh, just... and, uh bring back brendan fraser we'll see well I'm, I'm just excited to see brendan fraser in something again um maybe he'll make like a little bit of a comeback maybe he can you know start doing something a little different come back into the scene a little bit 
Um, this will hopefully be the first Aronofsky movie I get to see in a theater <laughs> since I missed everything else. Yeah. Hopefully theaters will be open by then. Hopefully theaters. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they are open now, so hopefully that will play in the theater. Um, you know, they're yes. open selectively yeah. now. Hopefully uh, shit calms down. Wear your hope- masks, please, yeah, so we please. can all go back to seeing movies. <laughs> We'd love to see mu- uh, movies in theaters and hear the reaction. So please, everybody, be safe. Wear your mask. But uh, no, I, I think it would be cool. And um, maybe, yeah, maybe he can kickstart Brendan Fraser's career again like he kind of helped with mickey rourke so you know yeah yeah well i feel like brennan frazier was uh kind of typecast <laughs> into a certain type of role there for a while but i'm hoping this will like uh you know a come back in maybe a more dramatic way or you know whatever man whatever whatever he wants to do i'm just happy to see him back absolutely i i'm looking forward and uh one of my final thoughts here about Aronofsky as a writer like I joke and I say I don't need to watch Requiem for a Dream because I don't have any problem being depressed especially in 2021 or 2020 but um, he really is great at characterization and being true to his characters and putting them through situations that are realistic while fantastical and visually arresting all at the same time so I know he you know, he's kind of a divisive director sometimes, but he is, that is one of his strengths. He is great. And then he made, um, what the, is it Pax Harkana, that song, end up in every, every trailer oh. <laughs> for, yeah, yeah. for about 15 decades, anything time, something was a little dark. And then Inception finally, I think, took the... Inception knocked it out of its spot. Then everybody <laughs> yeah, the... was using the uh, Inception Music. sound. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. The, yeah, the swell. That. The Inception yep. swell. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what's next. Ugh. Maybe we should do a Christopher <laughs> Nolan episode at some point. Also, I wouldn't mind doing like a uh, Robert uh, Eggers. Is that how you say his last name? Eggers? <laughs> Depends on your accent. <laughs> Robert Eggers, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't mind doing something on him eventually and um, just more and more impressed by Robert Pattinson the more I see him as time goes on. Do you, you know who the next Batman is, right? Yeah. Robert Pattinson. Back, yeah, back that's what made connection. me think of all this, because right we're talking about connection. Batman. Yeah, yeah. So, so look like, at that, guys. It looks like we got um, all of our shows lined up now. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, so I guess we can wrap it up here, but um, I like his uh, film uh, catalog, you could call it. That sounds kind of pretentious to call it that, but that's pretty much what it is. His I, body I like, of work. I like <laughs> his, bo- his body of work. Um, no, I, I love it, and it's, you know... Obviously, I didn't realize how much I liked his work until uh, I looked at my media shelf and I had pretty much every movie of his. I was like, oh, shit, I guess I guess I like Darren Aronofsky. He I I love that each film seems to have kind of a different vibe. Um, I mean, The Wrestler was kind of filmed like a documentary. Um, A what? (laughs) No, I knew it as soon as I said that. I say documentary weird. Just so everybody knows. You mean a documentary? (laughs) Tree. No, I don't. It's an upstate New York thing. Uh, everyone who says it like I do knows where it's at. A so, documentary? <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, no, I, li- I like how each one of his films has a bit of a different style. He's experimental, and I like it because it, it never gets too boring or old. I just never know what to expect, so can't wait for The Whale. I think that's cool, too. You know, th- this is a passion project for us doing this podcast and we're just talking about things that we find interesting or we like we're not uh, cinephiles in that way but i think it's more about naturally coming to the films and i think that's cool that it wasn't that society or you know film threat or you know um any of those magazines empire any of that says i need to watch darren aronofsky films because that's what i need to be you know film literate to be you know literate in his in all the works of his great cinema it's like no you just kind of came to them naturally and made the realization it's like wow there's something about him that clicks and i think those are the better directors than it's nice to study film and i'm not saying don't be open to directors and going and exploring and doing it that way but that method methodology is fine but here it's more you know we're just laissez-faire more (laughs) go with the flow and yeah, I mean, really, whatever floats your boat, if like really analyzing something is how you get the most enjoyment out of it, then I appreciate that because I, I can't I can't analyze the way I see some of these other people do. I'm like blown away by what people 
take away from things. Um, we just want to talk about what we're naturally drawn to, I guess. It's just our commentary. And, and I'm sure we, there are facts that we don't catch all the time. But once again, you know, it's, it's open. It's finding them on our own. You can, we could list facts, but I like to, you know, emote the feelings that we get. And I think movies, mm-hmm. knowing, you know, yes, knowing composition and knowing story structure and knowing visual cues, that is very important to understanding film. But sometimes it's just, I, I get more enjoyment out of, this is what I felt. This is what I pulled. I wasn't trying to figure everything out. And when I just watch something, this was my visceral reaction to it. And that's what I like about us. And and then obviously your your insight on the visual effects. So I so oh, yeah. when people listen back to this, please keep in mind we're not saying we're, you know, scholars of Aronofsky. This is just our opinions. So That's the fun. That is the fun. That being said, what were your three favorite scenes out of your favorite Aronofsky movies? Mm-hmm. On the spot here. Let's see. I'll have to think about it. You go if you already have some. The ass to ass from Requiem for a Dream. <laughs> you asked me that question just to, just so that you can talk about ass to ass. <laughs> no, no, no explanation. Just to watch it. Watch Requiem for a Dream. If you, even if, like I said, you, you only need to probably watch it once. Uh, but yeah, that ass to ass Requiem for a Dream. Um, I actually really liked, like I said, in the fountain, the traveling to uh, Zabalba with uh, Tom, future Thomas and the tree of life. I just, yeah. it was, it was visually striking, like I mentioned before, and just kind of his revelation of accepting what, how the energy of the universe and life worked. I thought that was a really cool, profound scene. And um, I'm going to bring it back down to the wrestler though. I do there. I could probably pull something from something else, but God, I love the wrestler so much. Uh, I think one of my favorite scenes in the wrestler is uh, just him yucking it up as a deli clerk, like his daytime job is the deli yeah. clerk, and just like the lady giving him shit and him eating the egg salad out of the container, and it's like it was just the mundane, the mundaneness of life that Randy the Ram or Robinson made it to acceptable. He was he was always on. He couldn't shut it off. And that was kind of the main thing. He was put on this earth to entertain. Even if he yeah. had the most mundane job and the mo- dealing with the shittiest people, he was still going to be entertaining. So those are my three. That's Yeah, that's one of my favorites, too, because I just loved how charismatic he was at the deli counter. Like, I wish I had a... I wish my deli guy was that entertaining, you know. <laughs> um, and then side note, his... His uh, Darren Aronofsky's parents are in almost all the movies, uh, especially his his dad. But in The Wrestler, his parents played two of the older disgruntled deli customers. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. So it's a little Easter egg. Um, so that's yeah, awesome. I guess that's probably one of my favorites because it just made me like smile. I was like, the, he's like on all the time. He's a true entertainer. Um, the uh, Fountain has a lot. Um, I really do love. The monk stuff when he's in his little tree bubble um, traveling to the star. Um, I'm like copying your scenes now. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> we, we didn't discuss um, this beforehand. I just sprung this. So, yeah, no. OK, I have a couple. I have a couple more. So um, uh, Black Swan probably. Oh, it's hard because I don't want to like give stuff away. A scene at the end in the like the makeup room uh, when uh, Nina comes in to take her role over. Uh, as the black swan she decides um i'm the black swan natalie portman and mila kunas kind of face off over who's the real black swan oh yeah so i I liked that one a lot and then continuing into the the um climax uh so i guess that's like a whole (laughs) that's my favorite third act of a movie yeah the transformation into the black swan yeah her like her transformation starting in the makeup room um mother just the very end um, there's some cool practical effects, and uh, yeah, I don't want to say much about that, the, but the very end, the last few minutes of Mother. So those are probably, uh, that's four, I think, but that's, anyway, that's I fine. stole two of yours, so I did an extra. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> I dig it. But yeah, so that's going to kick us off for 2021. Darren Aronofsky, his body of work. Let's hope for better things for the rest of the year. This has been Signals from Pittsburgh. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.